Hey everyone, Adam here, So Wizard Podcast. Got another interview for you today. I got to sit down with actor Valerie Jane Parker to talk about her new movie, The Voices, which is available now. Uh, there's going to be a review for The Voices coming up. I just try to get the interviews out first. The people took their time to sit down with me, so I want to get them out as soon as possible. But it's a pretty cool movie, a cool concept on a horror movie. And one thing that was really interesting, and we talked about a little bit this in the interview, is that there's three different ages for the main character, and Valerie plays the oldest version, and the casting did a really good job finding two kids to play her at earlier stages in her character's life so that they didn't need to mimic each other so much. It's actually pretty fascinating to get into because I would have expected that she was picking up things from them being the more experienced actor, but it wasn't necessarily the case. I don't want to give it all away. I just thought it was a really fascinating talking point. We also talk about her creative journey and being able to succeed in the acting world without necessarily being a New York City or Los Angeles person, which I also found very interesting, especially given everything that's going on in the major cities are kind of in a hard time right now. Uh, anyway, enjoy the interview. Hey, everybody. I'm sitting down with Valerie Jane Parker, who has a new movie out now, The Voices. How you doing, Valerie? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Adam. Definitely. Thanks for coming on. I'm looking forward to this. Uh, before we get to the voices, I always like to ask creative people to go way back to the beginning of their journey. And when did you know you wanted to be an actor? Like, what was that spark? Um, honestly, my whole life. I have said that I wanted to be an actor since I was about six years old. Um, I grew up in a theater family, so I grew up around actors. I was in that community all the time. And I just, I knew that I loved it. Uh, first time I was ever on stage was in first grade, and I I was hooked. I got the bug really, really early on. Okay, so it was not like an abnormal thing for your family that you yeah, said, I'm going to be an actor. <laughs> it wasn't weird. In fact, it was cheaper than a babysitter, you know, just bring the kid along to rehearsal, make sure they're quiet, they sit on the sidelines, so no. <laughs> Okay, cool. So you're kind of um, kind of an industry kid, I guess. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> All right. Um how was those early experiences? I mean, I guess for you, maybe it was just normal. You didn't know another way. Um, yes and no. It was intoxicating. Like, it was a high. Like, the way that I think, like, um, okay, if you're a little boy and you or a little girl and you love doing sports, you want to grow up to be a sports star, the first time you're doing Little League is so much fun for you. I felt that way when I was even just watching other people perform. Like it didn't have to be me, just being in my parents' rehearsals, watching movies, watching shows. I just knew that that was what I wanted to be doing. And I didn't have that feeling creatively in any other way. Okay, and that's interesting. And you mentioned even when you were watching movies. Now, mm -hmm. as a kid watching a movie, could you get that same level of connection as maybe a kid who didn't see behind the scenes as often? <laughs> Um, maybe I think it was a good balance because sometimes when you see behind the scenes too much, you can't suspend your disbelief. Like you're analyzing everything and you're tearing it apart. I was able to both analyze it a little bit and be hopeful, like, oh, those are actors doing that. I could be an actor doing that one day, but also get caught up in the magic of it. Uh, it was still just the stories blew me away every time. That's great. Uh, where, where were your parents, uh, actors? Where were oh, they based out of? They were based out of Nashville. They had a theater company here in Nashville, Tennessee. My okay. dad was an actor and a director. My mom was a director and um, did costumes. She was a wardrobe person. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Jack of all trades. <laughs> Wish I could so like that. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't pick that skill up. <laughs> no, that's way that's way above my head. Bravo to anyone who can. That's, that's yeah. skill. It seems to take some dedication for sure. Absolutely. Lost art. Yeah, yeah, that's that's true too. You just go on Amazon now, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so Nashville obviously is known for music. It also has a big theater scene. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, no, we have a very small theater scene. Um, I'm just very lucky that that happened to be where the stars aligned me. <laughs> okay, cool. And for you, when you decided that act, well, I mean, I guess you decided right away that acting was a career but when you made that first step did you stay in nashville or was it new york la um you know i watched my friends go up to new york and la and no one could get an agent no one could get auditions and so i remember thinking i thought okay this is a really small talent pool here um 
and a lot less opportunities, but there's a lot less competition. So I'd actually decided that I would stay in Nashville just to get a credit or two under my belt to try to get a better agent in a bigger market. And while I was doing that, the industry ended up moving to the Southeast. So instead of moving to LA, I actually moved to Atlanta. Um, Atlanta does more film production than anywhere else in the entire world. It's been that way for the past several years and they are continuing to explode and blow up. Okay, that makes a lot of sense because, yeah, at the end of every show and half the movies, you do see thanks to Georgia. <laughs> yep, still to <in> Georgia. <laughs> Is that where you're still based out of now? Now I'm based in between uh, Nashville and Atlanta. There's only a four hour difference between there. So I work out of Atlanta, like spend time with my family in Nashville, um, and then bounce back and forth to LA when I need to. <laughs> Depending on work. Because like, I'd say my, rep, my reps are all now out of LA. So. Well, no, okay. it's in the Southeast. Um, anyway, it's a lot of, just, I like to be everywhere, Adam. I want to be in a couple places <laughs> all at one time. I need Hermione Granger's little time turner. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Book more projects in the same day. <laughs> yeah, wouldn't that be fun? Yeah, well, or exhausting. <laughs> yeah, more split personalities, right? <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> get a little bit more uh, manic in that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I saw on your IMDb you have a ton of uh, really cool TV credits. Oh, thank you. Was that um, kind of the product of being in Georgia, like being at the right place? Yeah. Um, I mean, episodics are filmed out here. So MacGyver, the resident dynasty, it all happens down here in the Southeast. Okay. And I have to ask specifically, Nashville, is that shot in Georgia or did they actually shoot that in Nashville? That was one of the only things that actually filmed here in Nashville. Um, Nashville, the TV series did actually take place in Nashville, but that is rare. We don't film much here. Even a lot yeah. of people you see a movie that takes place in Nashville, it's filmed in Kentucky or in Georgia. I mean, it's just crazy. They film all around, all around Nashville. It, it just seems so counterintuitive to someone on the outside like me, where it's like, you're doing that place, that place is well known be in that place <laughs> you know you would think so but it, it all comes down to dollars at the end of the day mm -hmm. they get more tax money back to film a state over and they've already got more crew built up there then that's where they go yeah the industry part of it yeah <laughs> all right um so you're bouncing all around getting a lot of work which is great were you always drawn to horror or is that just kind of come along and you said i'll give it a shot well, I wasn't allowed to watch horror growing up. Um, being a pastor's kid, there was like a very strict, yeah. Okay. <laughs> all over the TV. I remember trying to watch Rosemary's Baby when I was in like junior high. Uh, a friend was like, oh, you gotta, you gotta turn this on. This is cool. And my mom comes running into the room screaming like 30 minutes into the movie, turn it off, turn it off. <laughs> um, that's a great film, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, where is something I gotta do when I... Uh, turned 18 <laughs> I was like oh I can watch horror movies now and I loved it and I actually ended up kind of making my folks watch them so I was like no you have to like I think horror movies are modern day morality tales like they always have a message they tell a story they play with tropes and it's fun and you have these stereotypical characters but a good horror film kind of flips it on its head and you get that I don't know I, I love horror I, like I think it's a really interesting genre horror fans are the best um but the genre itself is just so unique because it relies on old tropes but it tells the same story in new and fresh ways every time and it's just fun it's, they're fun to watch those are some really good observations and good ways to put it because it, it does have the same tropes and you could almost dismiss mm -hmm. it as like a paint by number or something but with like the morality tales and there's there's always an element of people getting what's coming to them more or less and, you know, maybe in extreme ways, but <laughs> you know, if you yeah. screw up and. <laughs> and those tropes make us feel safe. Like they let us let down our walls, which then lets the movie surprise you because if mm -hmm. it didn't rely on those troops, you would just be like on edge the whole time. You wouldn't be able to relax, but instead you're like, Oh, that's probably the final girl. That's the slutty one. That's the stoner. Okay. That's like, you feel like you know where it's going, which then allows it to surprise you and genuinely scare you make you laugh make you feel something that kind of safe fear rather than just being <laughs> uh anxious the whole two hours <laughs> yeah absolutely absolutely and surprises are fun it's why yeah for sure like right yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that uh that little experiment you did having your parents sitting them down and say no give it a shot did that yeah. turn out okay or was there a lot yeah, of resistance 
No, it actually did. Uh, I'm so lucky. I was raised by very open-minded people, and they are they're cool. So they were they were open to trying it. Awesome, and they have to be thrilled about how things are going for you professionally. Yeah, they're so supportive. They're just amazing, amazing parents. Nice. Got to make things a whole lot easier. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. So your latest movie is, I think you have two movies coming out now, right? The Voices and Wrong Turns Not Far Behind? Wrong Turn actually just came out, but yeah. Oh, just came out. Okay. It was a couple weeks before The Voices, but yeah, back to back bookends. Oh, okay. Um, do you want to talk about Wrong Turn first, since it came first? Sure. Whatever you, you, however you want to do the interview, Adam. It's, yeah, okay. <laughs> just kind of going with it. <laughs> Uh, well, how did that one come across your desk? I got the call from my agent saying, do you want to audition for this? Um, it was super short. I liked that the character was kind of a jerk. And I thought, oh, I can have fun with this. So I was just a total idiot in my audition. I improved half of it and made it really fun and funny. And they loved it. So they let me go to set and do just that. Um, oh, awesome. So it, was a, it was a great time. <laughs> That can't be the uh, the norm to have such free reign in the audition process. No, no. But I just kind of felt, I don't know. I thought, I know this girl. I'm going to push this to the edge and see where it goes. And <laughs> it paid off. Sometimes those risks pay off. Sometimes they don't. So <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's true for people listening. If you're giving it a shot, maybe that's not the way to go all the time. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> Is this wrong turn a remake or sequel or one of those kind of both well, they basically reinvented the franchise. So our director, Mike Nelson, worked with a screenwriter from the original Wrong Turn. Um, so it has the blessing of everybody who created the Wrong Turn franchise to begin with on it. But they restarted the series. And you're going to find that what they did in this film, it's much more intelligent um, than the original one. Like they, they do more of an intellectual spin on it. The thrills are a little bit more psychological the warfare is a little bit more psychological there's still a lot of jumps and scares but um it's it's a smart reboot it's clever it's not what you'd expect awesome okay and um when when would that one shoot that one shot um the end of 2019 fall of 2019 okay so you got it in uh, before everything got shut down mm -hmm. yeah how in the house on that one <laughs> sorry I did post-production from the house on that one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> How was that uh, process? Is that interesting? Oh, it's weird. It's really weird. Yeah. On an iPad and like try to sync it up. I mean, it's great that we have the internet now. I'm sure you know as a host, like it's, oh, uh, the pandemic opened up a lot of doors in terms of ways that we can communicate new technology, but it's still, it's strange. It's a, it's a strange new time. It absolutely is. Yeah. Uh, from my hosting side of things, it's been huge because, you know, I'm, I'm located in upstate New York. I'm not even in the city. So getting access to actors and stuff is pretty much non-existent unless there's like a convention. Um, so like we wouldn't be talking otherwise, which is great. Uh, but I understand that it was, you know, not great for the most part. I, I think that, you know, with everything in life, it's a mixed bag. And I think that there is a lot of good that came out of even a national, uh, I'm sorry, not national, global pandemic. Um, I think everybody came together with a lot more compassion um, and kindness. And I think a lot of people learned to value their families and home time. So there's a lot of good. There's a lot of good that could be said for that extremely stressful time. Plus, yeah. we all trauma bonded together as a country. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, a healthy way to look at it. And I think people who get too stressed need to take a step back and take that approach. <laughs> So the uh, the overall shoot before the post production, uh, how was that experience? Was it a long shoot or was it a quick one? I was only with them for a few days of it, um, oh. um, and my time on set was fun and delightful. Um, the atmosphere was very just charged and energetic and free. Mike is a director who is excited, and he brings excitement to set, lets you play, and so it just created a fun time. It was a really fun experience. Awesome. Um, this is kind of jumping back to something we already covered, but um, all of your TV appearances, maybe not all that's kind of generalizing, but your TV appearances, do you like that joining an existing cast? Like they're kind of a well-oiled machine and then you jump in. Um, is that fun? Is that intimidating? A little both? 
Um, it depends on the atmosphere and set. Um, it, yeah, it can be both. It can be delightful and just the best gift ever. Or it can be very intimidating depending on if the crew and the other actors are kind or if they're clickish. I've been really lucky that I've been on generally very happy sets. So when you get invited in, they kind of treat you like a family and you become part of the family. That's the best. That's the best feeling in the world. Um, not every set is like that. Some are a lot more standoffish and maybe not a functional family. It's a dysfunctional family <laughs> you're walking in on. Those are awkward and uncomfortable, but I'm very blessed to say that in my work experience so far, those have been very rare for me. And instead, I've mostly gotten invited to super happy sets and you get to be a part of their amazing family. And it just, it feels like a treat. That's great. Uh, it's a really good work environment. It's kind of that um, summer camp vibe, I imagine. <laughs> 100%. Yeah, you nailed it with summer camp. That is spot on. <laughs> Okay. Um, and so now the voices, were you working on that simultaneous to wrong turn? I actually filmed the voices right before I filmed wrong turn. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Uh, pandemic slowed everybody down mm -hmm. for most in terms of, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah. <laughs> All right. And that one, same deal. Your agent gave it, you read it, you went in on your audition to say the standard thing. Uh, yeah, sort of. That one was a very long process. Um, that one, with me being such a large part of the film, uh, that was several months of auditions. So I got it, I read for it, got callbacks, read for it, read the whole script several times, had to make sure it was something I loved and wanted to do, approved of it, had to do chemistry readings, and all this you're doing in the midst of doing other projects. Um, so getting cast on that one and agreeing to do it, that that took it was almost a six month process. It was a very, a very long time frame. Um, wow. especially, yeah. Cause when you watch the film, my character Lily is actually played by three actresses. Uh, I'm the oldest one, but there are two younger versions of me. And they also want to make sure the actresses they got there that we all synced up in terms of just mannerisms or vocal qualities, things like that. Um, so it was very, very detail oriented on the casting front. That's really interesting. So when you when you did the multiple auditions, did you kind of try to play it the same way every time, or did they say, "Hey, we like these things, maybe change these," and you were kind of inventing the whole time? Hmm. Um, so generally, when you have a callback, they'll tell you not to change anything unless they give you a note too. Um, so for the most part, I was doing similar stuff, which is then interesting when you keep reading for it and they don't have any notes, and you're like, "Do you want me to change? I can change. I can. I can do this." <laughs> I can, uh, and they're like, "Oh, we love it. Just do it again." You're like. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, but it's best to not guess what they want or to change it ahead of time. So no, I just kept, there's so many moving parts behind the scenes that you as an actor don't think about. So when you're getting all these callbacks, you think it must be you, that you're missing something or you're not doing something right. What I didn't know was that, no, they're actually trying to sync me up with two younger me's. And so they want to see me do it again because they just saw her do it. And they think that that will match really well what I'm about to do. Or they were also trying to cast John, who plays my husband. Um, and we were supposed to have in-person chemistry readings. And then I kept booking stuff and he kept booking stuff and we couldn't meet up on the same sets. Um, and so there was also times like that where they were just trying to see if our energies would vibe. So there's so many, many moving parts behind the scenes that have nothing to do with you as an actor. Mm -hmm. But when you keep getting those calls, you think it does. Yeah, stick to it <laughs> unless you're told otherwise. You keep getting those calls because they like exactly what you're doing. Just do it again from the top. <laughs> <laughs> Is it really hard to remember that? Like you kind of create a version of the character for the first audition. Two months later, like, hey, that character that you played for 10 minutes, do that again. Oh, well, isn't it? Yeah, isn't that the wonderful thing about tape? So most of the auditions that we do now, we self-tape. Thank God I can watch that tape again. Like, otherwise, yeah, it would be like, what, what did I do? Who was yeah, <laughs> that makes a lot of sense because I always find that fascinating. And even just doing the post-production, you're like, oh, yeah, I went and re-looped all my lines. And I'm like, how do you get back in that headspace? <laughs> you know, it's a weird thing that happens when you take on a character. Um Psychologists have actually studied it. The way actors' brains work is you almost literally do disassociate from who you are as a person and you go into another headspace, which sounds crazy because it is. So <laughs> um, I noticed, especially when I go back and I do ADR, I do the line looping, um, I find 
before I go into the studio, I can't remember any of that character. And I think, how am I going to be them again? As soon as I walk in and I hear those lines or I see a little bit of me doing it, it's like I start breathing differently. I feel them. And all of a sudden, there's space and my brain comes back. It's like Valerie goes away, whoever that is, comes back for the whole time we're doing it. And then afterwards, I can walk out of the studio and it's gone again. It's the strangest, the strangest phenomenon. And I know a lot of actors who feel this way, but once you click back into it, I don't know, it all comes rushing back. Yeah, that's fascinating. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. Kind of scary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess that's what separates you from, you know, maybe someone, even if they really want to do it and they just can't seem to make it work, maybe that's just like they're wired different than you are or something. Maybe, maybe it really is just a wiring in your brain that makes you work in a certain way. I don't know. Wow. That's just really, really interesting. <laughs> so um, when you were playing the character and you're the two younger version of yourself, did you meet them also prior to the movie? So they brought me to set a couple days early, wanted me to meet them uh, ahead of time. Unfortunately, um, Basically, things just kept happening and I didn't get to. So instead, even though I was brought to set early, I ended up just spending those couple days watching their footage. Uh, So I got to see what they had already filmed before. Now, I have met them all. I met the girls when we were filming post. Um, So I met them in post-production and we hung out then. And they're both lovely, lovely Jenna and Chloe, big fans. Um, But unfortunately, I didn't get to meet them before I filmed, just through the work they'd already done. That's also really interesting because I'd imagine... You being the older, not saying you're old at all, um, the older version of the character, would you have to maybe copy their mannerisms more than them copying yours or trying to find that? Yeah, that's what I was worried about, especially because Adult Lily is the majority of the script. And I thought, oh, I have all these things that I've worked on. What if they're not doing them? You know, this is kind of important to me. And especially when you think about the physicality of being blind, too. I was very, I worked for a month beforehand with my cane. Um, and learning just how to move. And I thought, they're not doing these things the same. This could really be a disaster. Um, That is where I have to give props to our casting director. Judy Bully did a phenomenal job, a phenomenal job with just making sure that she got three actresses who really did automatically move the same. It was crazy watching their tapes because there were choices that I had already made as an actor that they didn't know about that they were doing. Um, and it was just phenomenal casting. Like they just synced us in so well. Uh, very, very blessed. That's really cool that it came together that way. Cause I would imagine that you'd have to like study, study, study. And <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, you mentioned the, uh, the fact that your character is blind in the movie. How is something like that to practice? Cause I feel like if you do it too far, it's like, parody almost or like a cartoonish version which you obviously don't want to do yeah it was incredibly important to me that I make uh make it as authentic as possible and in no way a gimmick because this is a real thing that thousands of people deal with every single day and I in no way wanted to cheapen or dishonor their experience um so I spent about a month working with it I watched documentaries on not just on blindness, but especially specifically what happens with my character, someone who loses their sight, because it's a different thing than being born blind. It's a different form of mourning. It's a different thing mentally. It's also different in terms of muscle development, the way a person's eyes have already developed. If you used your sight for a few years versus if you never had it, it's, it's a different thing. Um, then after I did that, I got a cane and I would practice walking, got blackout glasses, put it around my house at first. You think you know your own space till you do that. It is much, much harder than you'd expect. Um, then I started running small errands blind, went to the get coffee a couple times, went to the grocery store once, uh, went hiking twice, things like that. But the most invaluable thing that I did to prep for being blind and to make sure that it was authentic is I have a friend named Bobby Holland who is blind and he was amazing. He took the time to sit down with me. We talked one-on-one just about practical things with his everyday life, stuff that you would never think of. Things like he was like, oh, I don't ever use a cane in my house. I just touch everywhere I go. I have the surfaces memorized or I don't set my cane on the ground when I go out to eat because I know I'm going to pick it up later and I don't want my hands to get dirty. I mean, just things like that that you don't think about unless you live it every day. And then he let me shadow him at his job. He's a sound engineer. We went to get coffee, just things like that. He just 
just let me be in his space all the time, show me tricks with how he uses his cane. And so getting to hear his one-on-one experience and then just spend a day following him around in his shoes was, that was invaluable. That was the best prep I ever could have gotten. That's really cool. That's uh, you do a lot of things that it, it takes me a second to ask you the next question because I'm just trying to wrap my brain around it. Like you're packing a lot in there. Would you like it if I talk slower? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's just uh, the audition process, and then the fact that you had two other people playing your same character, and then having to play blind and putting in all that research and everything is tremendous. So you do all this the the audition, the other people, the the blindness, how was that shoot? Was that, uh, you said you were a lot more on scene with that one? Uh, oh, shooting, vo- filming voices? The voices, yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, it was fantastic. No, I, I loved every every minute of it. Uh, I was there with them for three weeks, uh, the last three weeks of filming, and it was great. Uh, we had um the casting crew not the cast the crew had already worked together before this film um and they are a well-oiled team they're amazing so it was a lovely beautiful experience awesome and you did get to do post in that one in person so that's good (laughs) (laughs) uh unfortunately you didn't get to see this with an audience did you no i watched it by myself in my living room yeah (laughs) (laughs) family around (laughs) <laughs> I could have FaceTimed it. The truth is, I'm so selfish. Like as an actor, it takes a couple times of watching something you're into, like disassociate and actually be able to like watch it and enjoy it. So I was like, I just want to watch it by myself the first time, so that way, if I need to cover my face, like I can work through that. Um, like, <laughs> I think I'm doing a viewing party with my girlfriends next week. <laughs> there you go. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. Did this uh, get to film festivals or either of your movies, Wrong Turn or The Voices? Did, was it submitted to film festivals? No, um, it was not. Both of them had distributors purchase the films um, while they were still in post. So because of that, they didn't end up doing festival circuit. Yeah, that's honestly, great, though. It is great. And honestly, with COVID right now, you know, the last year, all the film festivals were digital. So it's a, it's a bit of a harder time to be doing yeah. people scene. For sure. Um, with other projects that you've done in the past, do you like that um, maybe the audience viewing experience or Q&As or things like that? Oh, yeah. It's fun. Yeah. The energy that you get off an audience is great because they're seeing it with fresh eyes. So all those surprises are brand new for them. Um, and you get honest feedback. Like, it's just, it's a real treat. Awesome. Is that um, kind of take you back to your theater days? Oh, um, <laughs> you know, I want to say yes, but no, because it would be like my theater days if I could float up outside of my body and watch myself performing and hear the audience. With theater, like you're so in the moment that you're like vibing off the energy of the crowd. And so your performance is changing based their mood. Whereas when you're watching the film, you're just getting to see how people honestly respond to you for the first time. So it's a, it's a little bit of a different experience. That makes sense. I could see that. Uh, so you you started in theater. You're an actor now, but you lived in Nashville. Do you also do music? No. no? <laughs> okay. I am one of 10 people in Nashville who does not do music. <laughs> <laughs> I really expected a yes. <laughs> yeah, I think that makes me a unicorn here. Uh, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Nope, I am only here because I love my family and they're here. And I just realized that if I'm not working, I want to be around the people I love. Life is short. Right. You don't want to work in your off time as well. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I think that's the American way, but yes. (laughs) (laughs) That's a good point. Yeah. (laughs) When you were on the show, Nashville, was your character musical at all? Because that was pretty much a musical show. It was a musical show, but no, she was not. No. Okay. I didn't know if maybe you had to fake it. No, I played Jeff Fordham's assistant on the show. My character's name was Angie, but Jeff was like the bad guy. So I just got yelled at. And like every scene, I got CDs thrown at me one time. I mean, like things like that. She was just like the the classic like girl next door who, who put up with a lot of crap. Oh, fun. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I don't want to eat up your whole day, but I really appreciate you taking the time to come on and talk about your career, your movies. It 
sounds really interesting. Sounds like you're having a good time, which is awesome. Oh, I'm loving it. Thank you for having me, Adam. This has been a great conversation. Definitely. Thank you. Um, do you want to tell people where they can find more of you online? Absolutely. I am on Instagram at Valerie Jane Parker. I know it's so creative. You'll never remember <laughs> my name. So on Instagram at Valerie Jane Parker, I do not tweet. So that is the best way to find me. And you should also find the voices. It is currently streaming on all the major video, video on demand services, Amazon Prime, Google Play, iTunes. So check it out. Awesome. Great. Thanks again. Yeah, thank you. I'd like to thank Valerie Jane Parker one more time for coming on the show to talk to me about her creative journey and her newest movie, The Voices, which is available now on VOD. Check it out. Also, make sure you like and subscribe to the channel. Really helps us grow our audience. Ton more interviews, ton more new movie coverage coming your way. As always, you're not going to want to miss out. Speaking of not wanting to miss out, So Wizard Podcast is updated every single week wherever you get your podcasts. SoWizardPodcast.com is your resource for reviews, recommendations, merchandise, videos, and more. So Wizard Podcast can also be found on Patreon, where for as little as $1 a month, you get multiple monthly bonus shows for it. And we love hearing feedback, so drop us a note in the comments, leave us something on social media, all the accounts we found after the show, and in the show notes. And on a more personal note, a good friend and I released a comic book earlier this year. It's an ongoing series called Social Studies. It's a... Uh, day-in-the-life, slice-of-life comedy comic about the high school experience done through the twisted prism of the 90s cartoons that we grew up on and love. Great cast of characters, uh, really amazing artwork by my partner there. Uh, we're really proud of what we're putting out, so check out Social Studies at socialstudiescomic.com. We're all over social media. It's either Social Studies Comic or Social Studies CB if the social media site didn't let us have the full name. Thanks.